Today, we'll be traveling to the cutting edge of legal technology as we explore a new frontier in terms of evidence, the inner workings of the brain. Hello and welcome to Talks on Law. I'm Joel Cohen. Today, we're joined remotely by Professor Emily Murphy of UC Hastings Law School. Emily, welcome to Talks on Law. Thanks for having me, Joel. This is exciting. I'm excited because this topic lies squarely in the intersection of a couple of interests, criminal justice and what up until very recently was science fiction, but we'll also be touching on philosophy, ethics, and the limitations of the brain. So we've got a lot to look forward to. Let's get started. Before we jump into, I suppose, the legal gears or get our feet wet in the science, why don't we take it into a specific example Professor, would you share about the case of Aditi Sharma? Sure. So this was a murder case in India. Ms. Sharma was accused of murdering her fiancé by giving him some prasad, a blessed uh, piece of food that had been laced with arsenic. And the way that the state wanted to prove this was by uh, subjecting her to what was called the Brain Electrical Oscillation Signature Test, or BIOS, a technique relying on a particular type of brain imaging called EEG. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Used now by a couple of Indian forensic state labs developed in India. And I was able to go to India and interview the creators of this technology who run a company called Axonet. And their technology has not been subjected to peer review. They are a private company. The idea was to bring Aditi Sharma into a room put her in a comfortable chair in an air-conditioned room, connect her to a bunch of electrodes on her scalp, and ask her a series of prompts to which she was not expected to respond. So prompts such as, I gave Udit the Prasad. And waiting for her brain to respond in with what the inventors of the technology call the signature evidencing experiential knowledge or not. Professor, am I understanding this right in the sense that they would say things um, like, I bought these sweets and I mixed those sweets with arsenic and their, their claim was that they could tell the veracity or they could tell whether what she was saying is coming from her memory? So Aditi Sharma didn't have to say a thing. These were prompts that were read in the first person but were read to her by investigators. She sat in silence. So they're analyzing her thoughts in a way. Her brain's responses to those prompts, which you could call her thoughts in some way. The idea behind this is, there's a couple of ideas behind it. One is that I think is relatively uncontroversial is that in general, our brains are pretty good at determining things that happen to us autobiographical knowledge from our own lives, from events that we did, from things that we observed or things that we heard about later. We're not perfect at this, but we're pretty good, right? And so the thesis of the researchers or the software developers of this technology is that there's some signature where given a prompt that corresponds with facts, autobiographical facts in one's own life, that the brain will, will be a giveaway that there will be some sort of tell in the brain that recognizes that statement, that prompt, as one that the person themselves has experienced. And they've called this experiential knowledge. It essentially functions like a guilty knowledge test. If this first person prompt designed by the investigators and read to her and requiring no response, she doesn't say yes, she doesn't say no, she doesn't say anything at all. If her brain recognizes that as her autobiographical story, the bio system would be able to, to do detect it. And indeed, that's what they claimed they did. So what did these technologists find, I suppose, when, when they were analyzing Aditi's brain? They found that she had experiential knowledge of the investigators and then the, ultimately the prosecutor's theory of the case, which was that she had premeditatively had, uh, bought these sweets, laced them with arsenic, and given them to her fiance in order to kill him. Wow. And so she was found guilty or? He was convicted, um, but a later Indian Supreme Court decision, and I, this is now more than 10 years ago, my details may be a little fuzzy. A later Indian Supreme Court decision 
held that this particular technology and a few other technologies, uh, interrogation technologies in use in India could not be used without the consent of the um, accused. And in there were concern, there are concerns that these violate human rights. The challenge is that, and scholars are writing about this problem in particular, is that in India, the alternative to interrogation is quite widely recognized as the third degree. The alternative is beating people. Janine Lokanita has written a wonderful book called The Truth Machines, and it is about interrogation and police violence in India. So in that context, the researcher said, we think this works pretty well, and it's better than the alternative. There's also claims that this type of technology gets people to confess especially when the alternative that they're faced with is is brutal interrogation techniques. We'll talk a bit about the persuasiveness of this type of technology to jurors, but you're pointing to something else that our listeners may not have thought of is the persuasiveness to the actual accused, that if they think it works, it, that may be good enough. I mean, that's that's a known function of lie detection tests in police interrogations as well, that they're not admissible in most jurisdictions for such purposes, and yet investigators will tell you that they elicit confessions. Well, why don't we talk about some of the uses for this type of brain scanning technology? And when I say this type, I don't mean necessarily this one company in India. I want to know, I suppose, what you see are the main use cases for, for being able to read the brain in terms of evidence. So I don't want to spoil the party and say, I personally don't think there are a lot of use cases, at least not right now. And before we start to think about use cases in particular, we need to think about what we're asking technology to do. And then what we're asking, because technology can advance and we can get better at it. But we also need to ask, what do we know about the biology of memory? And so Attempts at use cases have been, it, or different types of brain imaging technology, have generally been in criminal defense, not exclusively, but more often than not, well-off defendants. Sometimes post-conviction work, uh, trying to argue for exoneration or for habeas relief after some, a criminal defendant has been convicted. Those cases have often been promoted by promoters of this technology who are trying to sell a product and say this works and it's been admitted in court for an exonerated defendants. These are overstated claims of the legal importance of these technologies so far. But the hypothetical and imagined use cases would generally be, I think, more clearly on the side of criminal defendants who elect to voluntarily try to use brain imaging technology to bolster a defense claim. There may be imagined claims of use by the prosecution. And then these are not imagined. These are quite real, obviously, in India. But I think in the United States, we are much less likely to see those types of use cases because we run into all sorts of cons really interesting and currently unresolved constitutional questions about whether you can compel a defendant to, to undergo such brain imaging technology. That's such an interesting question. Does the government have a right to, uh, assuming they can, do they have a right to open the curtains and look deep into your brain? I don't think so. But even if they had that right, it is technologically infeasible to do it without a pretty cooperative subject. There are differences between the types of technologies that are used to look at brain imaging, but the more powerful one, in my opinion, of functional magnetic resonance imaging requires extremely expensive equipment that cannot be used with anybody who has any kind of ferrous or magnetic metal in their body. So eliminates some proportion of people. And what would eliminate anybody who didn't want to cooperate currently requires people to hold incredibly still in a loud clanging machine for a long period of time. And if, you, if anyone has ever had an MRI, you are rolled into a fairly small tube and have to hold very, very still. This is particularly true for functional brain imaging. There are now it's understandings that functional brain imaging research can be distorted by slight head movements, by swallowing, by thinking about different things, by staying moving off task. It is 
would require a highly compliant subject to be able to do fMRI with our current technology. So a hostile witness would would have to do little more than twitch their head a little bit to to game the system for now. Quite right. Yeah. At least as the technology currently exists. Maybe we could talk, I suppose, a bit more about the science itself. What are we ta- what are we referring to when it comes to brain images and what are the key technologies that are being, you alluded to a couple of them just then, but the technologies that we're envisioning for analyzing these brain activities. Yeah, there's a, a number of different ways that researchers and clinicians use to investigate people's, the status of people's brains, the structure of their brains, the shape of their brains, whether there's a tumor or something else or a, a blood clot in their brains, and then a different and sometimes repurposed set of technologies to figure out the function of people's brains, how parts of their brain are involved in different aspects of cognition or emotion. But the two that have been most highly developed for, let's call them forensic purposes, are EEG, electroencephalography, and fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging. And they're very different. Why don't we start with the EEG? I suppose, what are they mostly used for in day-to-day medicine? And then how how could they be used to analyze people's memories? Sure. EEG in daily medicine is most often used for um, sort of assessment of epilepsy um, because it is assessing directly the electrical activity in the brain, especially really though only on the outer surface of the brain, the part that's closest to your skull. EEG involves um, small electrodes that are placed directly on the scalp in particular locations, and there's different types of EEG arrays that measure very, very, very small oscillations of electrical activity. Because of course, our brains are full of neurons and neurons communicate with each other through electricity and then chemistry at the synapses where neurons join together. And our brains are always generating sort of small electrical oscillations in lots of different patterns. EEG tries to extract that electrical information, figure out what's going on. And then if we're trying to use it to detect something about behavior or thinking, it's usually put together in an analytical technique um, called an event-related potential. So our brains do have different electrical bleeps and bloops and signals. When bleeps and bloops. Yeah, particular signals. So there is a well-known response of a particular type of event-related potential called the P300 wave. And the P300 wave is sort of most shorthand, the best shorthand to characterize this is it's a response to stimuli, things we see or hear, external sort of stimuli that are rare, recognized, and meaningful. And just to back up though a little bit, an event-related potential, you might often see as a, a nice smooth graph. It's like, ooh, there's a big spike. EEG traces, raw data EEG traces, there are lots of teeny little, very squiggly lines to put together. To get event-related potential, researchers typically average EEG samples over a number of different trials. So they show a stimulus a number of different times, and only with more and more data, can they pick out a mean, the meaningful signal from the background noise of the activity of our brains. Professor, what's an example of a test where, where I suppose scientists or lab technicians would be attempting to identify an event? What was the term you used? Event-related potential, an ERP for short. Yeah, I suppose what's an example of a test where where technicians would be looking for an ERP it doesn't have to be in the criminal justice setting. Well, I can give you an example in the criminal in the research directed at the criminal justice setting is the ERP P300 signal is used in development of a guilty knowledge type test um, by researchers who work in this area that let's take an example. We have a murder scene. Someone was bludgeoned to death with a blunt object. And we have a suspect, but we're not sure what object was used. And we're pretty sure this is the person who did it. And you would show them a series of pictures of things you think are potential weapons in this case. So a crowbar, 
a baseball bat, the lead candlestick, and a piece of pipe. So if, if you see my brain going a little, uh, behaving a little differently w around the lead candlestick, then you might want to give that some further analysis. Exactly. You might infer that that lead candlestick has unique salience to you. It's meaningful for some reason to you, whereas to Joe off the street, who is not a suspect in that case, that particular stimulus would not be so meaningful and would not elicit a P300 ERP response. So I like the way you said meaningfulness, because it may be that my my beloved grandmother left that to me and, and thinking about the, the candlestick reminds me of someone very important to me, maybe enough to, to spike it, or it could be, well, I, you know, I use that for this particular heinous crime. This is exactly right, Joel. Or maybe we have a series of um, a hockey stick, a baseball bat, a golf club, and the one that gets the event related potential is the one related to the sport someone played as a child. <laughs> We're seeing some of the limitations already. Exactly. This is a really important thing to remember about all of the technologies, and we haven't talked about fMRI yet, about brain imaging, is that in order to stimulate the brain, to in theory extract from it whatever someone knows or has experienced, researchers or investigators have to design those stimuli. They have to have some background knowledge of what they think is, let's call it the ground truth of the world, like what really happened, such that and they have to account for what other types of things might be salient. So the choice of stimuli, and there has to be a comparison stimuli in P300 related research of thing, things that are not expected to be important or meaningful or salient versus things that would only be important or meaningful or salient to someone who has a particular type of knowledge that we're interested in. Got it. And the, the researchers and investigators have to make a lot of assumptions of varying degrees of confidence about which types of stimuli would be salient or meaningful or hit possibly on a false positive because your grandmother gave you that a candle, similar candlestick. And, and I was, you know, I was thinking of something lovely rather than something indicating guilty conscience. So that's the EEG. Was this, this was the technology that was used in a DT's murder trial? Yes, it's very similar. Uh, it does rely on EEG-based technology. They use a proprietary algorithm to analyze the signature, as they call it, of the, develop the expression of the experiential knowledge kind of pattern of behavior. No one, to my knowledge, has ever been able to analyze what the, the strength of the, the analysis of that algorithm. I think as a research question, the BIOS researchers have hit on something really interesting. Um, as a forensic matter, I have a lot more doubts. Well, that's EEG. The other tech you mentioned is fMRI. Maybe you can walk us through that a bit as well. Sure. Yeah, functional magnetic resonance imaging um, is a very safe, non-invasive, and like quite widely used research and clinical tool. Uh, used less often in clinical work. MRI, just the magnetic resonance imaging itself is used frequently and widely in all kinds of clinical applications. It doesn't require um, any x-ray exposure. It doesn't require any injection of radioactive compounds like other forms of imaging do. It just requires mainly that someone can hold still in a fairly claustrophobic space and not um, doesn't have any kind of magnetic metal in their body because it relies on the very slightly different magnetic properties of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. How does that relate to brain activity? Well, our brains are energy hogs. They need oxygen and glucose. There is no storage of energy in the brain. So when you are awake, when you are asleep, when your brain is functioning, it's getting blood all the time, right? And neurons that have been active recently, that have been firing and talking to each other. They need more blood? Need more blood. They're metabolically more demanding. They're tired. They need their oxygen. So the change from oxygenated to deoxygenated blood can be detected and correlates to blood flow to particular parts of the brain, which is a slightly time delayed but close proxy for neural activation of that particular part of your brain. 
So if I'm having some intense brain activity in a certain part of my brain, the demand for for new blood or for materials from from my blood would be pretty instantaneous. It's not instantaneous, but it's it's pretty Quick. short. It's, it's on the order of the, the time delay for what's called the blood oxygen level dependent signal, the bold signal, which is what fMRI detects, is on the order of a few seconds. So if I have a very complex thought or a very emotional moment, uh, there'll be some blood demands a second or two later or a few seconds later. Yes, and the, the analysis programs that that look at the extremely large amount of data collected from um, fMRI machines, take it, take that into account. Okay, so those are the two technologies. You mentioned that earlier that one of the limitations of the fMRI is currently it requires you to sit inside of a giant tin can. Yeah, more or less. There are new techniques being developed that are more portable. I mean, these tin cans are often found in medical imaging centers or research centers, they have to be, they are gigantic magnets, especially the ones that lead, that give you very precise resolution. And so they have to be appropriately shielded and they, you can't just plunk one into an office. And they're not cheap are either, are they? No, they're not cheap and they are not cheap to run either. Um, the, given the computing power and the manpower and the expertise and the computing, the software needed to, to run these machines properly. There are folks who are working on more portable, um, smaller versions of these, but there's some, I think, basic physics limitations that, that we bump up against. Why don't we turn to the application of these technologies within our courts? First, these as new technologies fit within an established legal framework when it comes to using new technologies. Maybe you can walk us through that quickly. Well, the frameworks differ depending on the jurisdiction you're in. So, of course, the law professor's answer is it depends. But in federal courts and many, but not all, state jurisdictions, we're going to follow something like that's close to or the uh, Daubert framework. Sometimes it's named differently in different states, which essentially is it was a Supreme Court decision. In 1993, Supreme Court decided Daubert versus Merrill Dow Pharmaceuticals and essentially set out a five factor test for assessing the reliability of, admissib of scientific evidence as one of the criteria, not the only criterion, but one of the criterion towards its admissibility. And this five-factor test wraps into it the older federal standard, which is still a standard in some states. I want to show off a little bit. That's the Fry standard. That's exactly right, sir. Yes, you have been cold called successfully today. No. <laughs> the Fry standard is a more of a general acceptance test that looks to the relevant researcher body to say, is this a technology that's generally accepted? Is this a technology and a methodology that's generally accepted as reliable? So you'd go to the experts. You'd say, if this is a something related to the brain, maybe we would ask neurologists, do we accept this? Yes, it's highly deferential to the experts. Whereas the Daubert standard itself puts judges in the position of being gatekeepers. There's several factors. Again, it's a factor-based test. It's not, it's not a hard and fast rule, but it meant to put judges in the position of being gatekeepers to determine whether a methodology is valid, not whether the conclusions from that methodology are valid, but whether an expert's offered methodology is valid. So whether the technique or theory can be and has been tested, is this a, a falsifiable hypothesis? They didn't put it in those terms whether it's been subjected to peer review, which is how science generally tries to progress by scrutinizing the data and the technique and the methods of, of other scientists, whether it has a known or potential error rate, which is again, important for understanding something as scientific rather than kind of science adjacent, the existence and maintenance of standards controlling its operation. Do we run PCR machines the same way each time? That's important to make sure we have valid, say, COVID-19, accurate forms of testing? Do we understand the, the base rates, the known error rate? These types of factors are things that verify something as science rather than, and scientific, that adhering to the scientific method rather than just the say-so of this particular expert. And then the last factor being that widespread acceptance in the scientific, relevant scientific community. So the last factor is kind of a nod to to Fry or to the, the, the prior standard. 
it's a nod, but I think it's an important incorporation because it, but although it doesn't define the relevant scientific community, and of course that would be up for argument between the the offering side of the side offering the expert and the side saying that this technique is is not does not work. We've talked about some of the, I suppose, flaws in in forensic science in some other interviews related to the Innocence Project and to a couple of forensic labs. Maybe you don't agree, but Daubert, it does seem to be an upgrade in some respects because they're they're requiring not just that you know ninety nine percent of dentists recommend this toothpaste, but that there's some objective evidence, hopefully, to back up the new tech. In an ideal world, yes, in and an there's ideal a world. massive literature about whether Daubert has succeeded or failed. The question is whether it puts judges in a position that they are well suited to be in. Um, judges who by and large, lack any kind of scientific training. I mean, most people who go to law school don't come from a scientific background, not not all of them, but many, if not most. And having experienced the attempt to teach um, some basic statistical inference and statistics methods to law students and being met with sort of shock and horror, you know, this, this is not... <laughs> well, Emily, we need more lawyers like you. We need, which is why I'm trying to train them this way. Um, yes. So Daubert has been the, I, I have not done these studies. The empirical literature though is that Daubert is kind of widely recognized at this point to be sort of a mess in lower courts. Maybe this was entirely predictable given when you have a very flexible five factor standard rather than a, a hard and fast rule or deference to experts. I I'm kind of agnostic as to whether it's better or worse than Fry. Both are subject to zealous advocacy. I mean, I, I don't know how we would design an, a standard for scientific evidence that is compatible with the role of zealous advocacy in the courtroom, because the zealous advocate is going to intelligently define the relevant set of experts for whom this technology is valid and useful and helpful. And the, the opposing side will say, those people, this is not the relevant set of experts at all. It's, it's this set of people over who say no, right? So ultimately a judge is gonna, is kind of adjudicating a battle of the experts. Um, some techniques are better than others at giving us known error rates. Cutting edge techniques, which may still nevertheless be reliable, may not have and may never have knowable error rates. And that is kind of the nature of scientific evidence, especially when you start to move towards evidence of real world behavior. Interesting. Is that because you can't put it into a lab setting? It's not because you can't put it into a lab setting. It's because to get the real world error rates, we would need massive epidemiological studies of how people behave in the real world. And for example, specific to the issue of memory detection, we don't have a very good understanding of how often people make memory errors in their daily lives. We have some understanding, but we don't have a widespread epidemiological study. And it might in fact be impossible to do that because in order to do that, we would have to have vast numbers of subjects where video cameras around their necks, which is done in some memory research to, to get the ground truth of what happened. And then we would have to test to have those subjects recount their narrative of their life at many different points throughout their life. And we'd have to check them. That that's not research that can happen. <laughs> but we know from the best available memory research, we know that memory errors are incredibly common. I mean, you and all the other viewers here have probably had these experiences, deja vu being the most prominent one, people, deja vu is an experience of like having the subjective experience that you've experienced something before when you definitely haven't. I mean, unless we live in the matrix, right? We do know that people's memories change even when they're not, there's no nefarious purpose for that. We, memory is not a video camera. It's a constantly reconstructive process. And our best current research on memory retrieval and reconsolidation shows us that down at the cellular level of how memories are encoded, each time we reactivate a memory, we make it subject to change 
I don't know how we would design an, a standard for scientific evidence that is compatible with the role of zealous advocacy in the courtroom, because the zealous advocate is going to intelligently define the relevant set of experts for whom this technology is valid and useful and helpful. And the, the opposing side will say, those people, this is not the relevant set of experts at all. It's, it's this set of people over who say no, right? So ultimately a judge is gonna, is kind of adjudicating a battle of the experts. Um, some techniques are better than others at giving us known error rates. Cutting edge techniques, which may still nevertheless be reliable, may not have and may never have knowable error rates. And that is kind of the nature of scientific evidence, especially when you start to move towards evidence of real world behavior. Interesting. Is that because you can't put it into a lab setting? It's not because you can't put it into a lab setting. It's because to get the real world error rates, we would need massive epidemiological studies of how people behave in the real world. And for example, specific to the issue of memory detection, we don't have a very good understanding of how often people make memory errors in their daily lives. We have some understanding, but we don't have a widespread epidemiological study. And it might in fact be impossible to do that because in order to do that, we would have to have vast numbers of subjects wear video cameras around their necks, which is done in some memory research to, to get the ground truth of what happened. And then we would have to test to have those subjects recount their narrative of their life at many different points throughout their life. And we'd have to check them. That that's not research that can happen, but we know from the best available memory research, we know that memory errors are incredibly common. I mean, you and all the other viewers here have probably had these experiences, deja vu being the most prominent one, people, deja vu is an experience of like having the subjective experience that you have experienced something before when you definitely haven't. I mean, unless we live in the matrix, right? We do know that people's memories change even when they're not, there's no nefarious purpose for that. We, memory is not a video camera. It's a constantly reconstructive process. And our best current research on memory retrieval and reconsolidation shows us that down at the cellular level of how memories are encoded, each time we reactivate a memory, we make it subject to change. I was reading about this. I found this so disturbing. It was, it, it was, it, what you're saying in, is in a sense, the more you think about a memory, the less confidence you should have in that memory because you may be tweaking it each time. I think that's true and supported by the research. Um, I also think that it, that reflective and serious people might think understand that that's true in their life and that people may be able to experience this if they have been a, a good diary keeper or if they were a good diary keeper some, some number of years ago. And if they were asked to spontaneously recall an event but without looking at their diary recollection and compared their contemporaneous recollection with the recollection from 10 or 15 years ago, there will inevitably be, I would wager, inconsistencies. I'm not sure whether this was This American Life or Radio Lab, so I apologize. I'm a fan of both shows, but I really enjoyed this one episode where they, they looked at what they thought was a clear example where people's memories were locked in, which was, what were you doing on September 11th? And people were so crystal in their minds. And then they went back and looked and compared against others with contemporaneous experiences and the memories were incredibly inconsistent. There's also an incredible Atlantic article also about the events of September 11th, and it was particularly about one family who tragically lost their young adult son and the parents' reactions and then his fiance's reaction. And there was someone of his belongings that was at issue with who gave it to who when. And we read all three of these different people's retellings of this unbelievably salient and highly traumatic event in their lives. And they were, and plus the, the brother and other family members and their recollections were entirely incompatible. There was no way that those four people's stories could be reconciled. Some people's memories were wrong. 
which I suppose in a way this should this should point to the fact that a lot of other aspects of our criminal justice system rely on very imperfect information. And right now I'm thinking of eyewitness testimony. Um, so even if if this data, even if this type of technology uh, proves itself to be imperfect, uh, well, join the club because a lot of the other tools we use in, in the court are also imperfect. Yeah, exactly. And we are, have a much better understanding of eyewitness memory from decades of converging scientific research now. And some jurisdictions are now developing procedures and jury instructions for how to handle eyewitness memory and for how to educate the jury about how to analyze, not how to what weight to give it, but how what factors affect eyewitness memory such that they can have a slightly better, more scientifically informed consideration. And that's that's a big change. We used to have exclusively expert testimony about whether eyewitness memory was reliable or unreliable um, and not necessarily as applied to this particular case. And now those that expert testimony is moving into jury instructions. It's moving into law itself, which I see as an extremely positive development. What we don't know is what jurors really do with those instructions, because some survey data that we have, the last survey data I've seen on this question um, from close to a decade ago now shows that huge swaths of the lay public believe that memory acts like a video recorder and believe that confidence equals accuracy or strongly correlates with accuracy. And if it's a, someone says on the stand, I saw him, he did it, it was him, I'm 100% sure that that is in some cases enough to secure a conviction. I do think what you point to, the, the difference between current science and perhaps common understanding when it comes to memory, there's, there's quite a gap. But why don't we go back to brain-based memory detection? I suppose we're not quite at the level where we have examples from, from court cases, but could you apply what you think would be some of the main issues or some of the main questions that, that a court would look at if they're if they're using a Daubert Fry test? Well, I think it matters who's who's offering it, right? And in terms of the questions that the court, like how, how rigorously a court might wish to scrutinize this, if it's uh, being offered by the prosecution in order as corroborative evidence of guilt to say, this defendant has a unique recognition signature, their brain recognizes the Paisley pattern on the couch where the victim was found. And the only way they would know that would be if they were there at the crime scene. Exactly. Exactly. It's a couch that has, there were only a hundred made in the world and they are arguing that this alleged recognition memory of experience is akin to guilt or to place the murderer at the scene of the crime. Well, if that's being offered by the prosecution, first of all, we go, the judge would want to go through the Daubert standard and say, is this memory detection technique well understood? Is it something that um, is peer reviewed and tested? And there, there would be some support. There is a, a growing body of fMRI based memory detection evidence that uses real world experience that um, where, for example, subjects or volunteers wear a camera around their body and walk around for three weeks with it randomly taking pictures and then are asked to later on discriminate between photos that show scenes from their own life, totally mundane scenes that they may never have paid attention to, right? So they're maybe very weakly in what we call encoded um, versus scenes from someone else's life. And so a recognition memory and th those dis uh, answers are sometimes right and sometimes wrong. The researchers know which ones are right and wrong. Um, so they can figure out the false positive rate, they can figure out the error rate of people's subjective experience. But then the um, fMRI data during this task of exposure to pictures from your own life or pictures from someone else can be used to train a machine learning algorithm that can, with a fairly high degree of accuracy, distinguish between brain states. Interesting. So there is, the, in certain conditions at least, there's some real scientific evidence backing at least the, the theory behind this technology. And the practice behind this technology. Um, 
But the important thing of what you said is under certain conditions, right? Under those conditions, the researchers know the ground, what the ground truth really is. They know where that person has been because that volunteer wore a camera for three weeks. To me, then, yes, and they can check the footage, right? And they, they know that this camera was assigned to this subject. There's just no question about what the ground truth really is. What we're learning from that, though, is that from those studies, and I think this goes back to the memory point, uh, what we've learned from some of those studies is that people get it wrong, right? They don't have, sometimes they say, no, that wasn't my life. Maybe it's a picture in a parking garage, something that they would not have any reason to remember. It's not salient. And it actually was, or they may identify a, a picture as from someone else's life as from their own life. So they make subjective errors, right? We know the objective status. The brain imaging algorithms, the algorithms that analyze the brain imaging data are shockingly, like stunningly good at detecting objectively correct memory status, but are not good if the subject, if the person themselves believes that they have this memory when they actually don't. Oh, interesting. Yes, they're not good at detecting- um, False positives in a way? Yeah, a subjectively believed but objectively incorrect memory for that. So here, if we had the case of a witness who says, I saw Emily leaving the drugstore. I know it was her. I know exactly what she was wearing. Let's imagine a scenario where that memory is incorrect. This test may not be helpful at all. Correct. Yes, I think that that is right. And so a couple of things come into play there, right, in terms of evaluating this under the Daubert standard. The technique and methodology and software may be all kind of validated through peer-reviewed studies. We know the error rates in controlled laboratory settings. In real-world settings where the ground truth is not known. Now, if you have surveillance video showing that it's not Emily coming out of the store, then, you know, we have your, your what your evidence is, is of the, sub, with the sort of um, subjective belief of the witness. The witness could be entirely truthful and yet mistaken. Is this why you talk about it in, in your research as a distinction or, or, or why some describe it as a distinction between memory detection and truth detection or, or some type of veracity test? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. You could have witnesses who are being entirely truthful. They're not trying to deceive. They are not lying but they may have an incorrect memory. And I argue, along with my co-author in our recent paper about this, that while proponents of memory detection for forensic purposes have said, well, this is not lie detection, which has been rejected by the courts, including with brain imaging technology, um, because we're not, it doesn't matter if someone is trying to deceive, we're not asking for any kind of response, but ultimately, if what the court cares about, and sometimes what the court cares about is whether the witness is subjectively deceiving, right? But if what the court, what the fact in dispute really is, is the underlying truth of what happened, then you can have a witness who is 100% believes they're telling the truth, who is also 100% mistaken. And to me, I think that means that lie detection and memory detection in many cases where what we're trying to figure out is the facts of the world um, merge and are kind of equally unreliable. It's not that we're going to find a trace of the real world, a video trace of the real world somewhere in someone's brain. You make a good point that, you know, similar to a lie detector test, if the person believes it, then it's going to, you know, it's going to show up as truthful and that may not be helpful. I mean, there you're not, you're not actually seeing the truth. Yeah. If what you're interested in is this witness's sincerity, then it is useful, right? But what our system leaves the determination of witness sincerity squarely as a question for the jury. That's one of the reasons why lie detectors have been not looked favorably upon by all kinds of jurisdictions, because I mean, that that's where it, when it showed up in the Supreme Court, Justice Thomas wrote, 
this is this is a question for the jury. The sincerity of the witness is one of the four testimonial capacities. This is why we have a jury system in the first place. It is, you know, there are technological and scientific questions about whether these things are reliable, but even if they were perfect, there's still that question of whether or not this is something we want a machine to do or whether this is something we want fellow citizens to do. And neither are perfect. I don't think so. And they come with trade-offs. And I would be concerned about a future where forensic evidence moved to the direction of trying to peer into people's brains because while the technology is getting better and better and doing amazing things and teaching us incredible things about the neural mechanisms of memory, what we are starting to do is get so good at understanding that, that we're running up against biological limitations. Now, if we run up against biological limitations that we are not perfect mnemonics, we don't remember everything with perfect accuracy. Everybody remembers things differently based on perception and attention and what we encode and what we think about and what we ruminate on. Memory is dynamic and it has to be for us to function in the world. But if we try to make it essentialized that somewhere in the brain exists the truth, I worry we start to obscure other values of the judicial system and the jury system, especially if that is something we're committed to, I think we need to accept the flaws of the jury system for what they are and say, you know, they are not overcome because humans are inherently biologically limited from being perfect recorders of the world. Yeah, I don't see us replacing juries with um, with AI, for example, anytime soon. But Some people who think that might be a better system. If you can trust the AI... Could trust if you could design AI without the human biases, query whether that can could ever possibly be done by humans, right? There's an extensive literature on this. But even if we could, is that the system we would want? It's certainly scarier to the individual because it's it's this black box. At the same time, the jury is the black box, right? Like we are not allowed to open the black box of jury deliberations, federal rules of evidence protect against this and state rules do too, with some very narrow exceptions to do specifically with bringing forth bias. But we don't ask a jury to explain their verdict. And there's a there's reasons for that. There's reasons, but I'm sure as a neuroscientist, you you wish you could in some cases, you know, check the tires on on how these decisions are coming out. Yes, and that's some of the best jury project research has started, was able to unpack and do that. But we don't do that as a matter of course in most criminal justice proceedings for values of finality, for values of um, getting, you know, this is what the jury says and this is there. And therefore, because it's what the jury says, it is legitimate. It's a, it's a mess to find facts, right? And by keeping it neatly enclosed in a jury black box. So the question I think is one of weighing it against two black boxes. The jury black box of your peers or the, the black box of a allegedly perfect AI system? Is there something intangibly important into the dignity of the jury system, of the criminal justice system to be judged by a jury? Why don't we imagine this world that you described where, where this technology is better? You know, I, I'm going to make an analogy to driving your car versus driverless cars. Let's say we're in a world where the driverless cars are objectively much safer or where this technology is objectively effective. What are some of the constitutional issues that it would raise in terms of using it uh, by the prosecution, in terms of compelling it? These are questions that start to, are starting to fall under the rubric of what people are calling cognitive liberty. Um, it raises questions of Fourth Amendment search and seizure. Is the, Does the Fourth Amendment right to be secure in our papers, houses, and effects extend to the right to have our skulls remain private, right? The interior unexpressed thoughts, it, remain, it butts up against the Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination, which, you know, we are not compelled to testify against our own interests. Our unexpressed thoughts or automatic thoughts detected by brain imaging technology with no outward testimonial sign, are they 
testimonial for purposes of the Fifth Amendment. Nita Farahani has written extensively about both of those questions, and I think they are entirely untested and unresolved. She's come up with some spectrums and ways of thinking about them, but we don't really know. The Sixth Amendment right to uh, have your case decided by a jury goes to our question about which black box you would prefer. Knowing that a jury is flawed, do you nevertheless have some sort of dignitary right to be decided by a, a group of flawed people? But I think the Fourth and Fifth Amendment rights about whether we have particular rights to cognitive liberty when, if in the hypothetical situation, brain imaging technology could extract the truth, the truth as it was undisputed and important to what happened. Um, I don't I don't know how that would come out. I, I wonder. It seems like the the Fifth Amendment right to not incriminate would at least be triggered if if you were the if you were the, I suppose the suspect or the target of an investigation. There, I think it jumps out to me without having done much research that you might be able to claim that right. Yes, although in the Supreme Court case of Schmerber, where um, your blood alcohol content is not considered testimonial evidence, and such that it, a, your Fifth Amendment right against testifying against yourself is not triggered by a compelled blood draw to in order to preserve evidence of your blood alcohol content. So are our thoughts covered by the Fifth Amendment? I mean, that it seems to be much closer, right? Because it's testimonial, things we say or write or express. They seem much, much, much closer to our thoughts and not our blood alcohol content. But blood alcohol content can be incredibly incriminating, right? That could be the slam dunk case for a DUI. So where does that line of bodily integrity and cognitive liberty lie, especially in the face of public safety? Um, this has come up as hypotheticals in cases of terrorism, right? Or the, the ticking bomb where we have a certain amount of time in order to prevent a mass tragedy. Do we then, does the government then have a, an overwhelming interest in invading the mental privacy of someone who has said, I'm not saying anything. Interesting. So you're envisioning a situation where, where perhaps, you know, it's not uh, for proving guilt or innocence, but, you know, if we could use that, this technology to know which train car has the dangerous substance and you could just show the images and, and detect it in the brain, does the government have the power to force that? Yeah. I mean, right now, these, are, these questions are still hypothetical, and they may remain so for some time. But, you know, at some, I would not be surprised at some point to see this type of question being brought forth to a court. And I don't know what the answer is. Professor, one thing that we should probably touch on is the impact of this type of technology, if it's used on the jury. What do you envision, and I suppose by analogy, since we haven't seen it in U.S. courts, you know, what type of risks does it present? The impact of what brain imaging technology might do to a jury is, is in, in some sense, it's an empirical question, right? Like it's something that we should be able to answer with research subjects, put, give them brain images and ev based evidence and say, what happens? Well, there's been a number of studies look, trying to do that. I've been part, involved in some of those. And the evidence is frankly all over the place. We're not getting a clear picture that the, this is always unduly persuasive and always sways the juries, or sometimes we're getting evidence that it has no effect at all, especially compared to uh, clinical psychiatric evidence about say someone's mental state. The evidence is, is all over the place. The initial concern was that brain images would be so persuasive to jurors because it's, it's, I'm looking into their brain. I'm, the brain is lighting up. This is, this, this is science or magic, right? And that it would be unduly persuasive. And, you know, when I first wrote about this topic with my co-author, Tennille Brown in 2010, we thought this is concerning enough that it might actually be, there might be an argument to exclude such evidence, even if it were reliable and relevant under rule 403, which kind of weighs the evidence's relevance against its what's called unduly prejudicial impact. And if jurors, if, if the empirical evidence were showing us that jurors automatically believed anything if you slapped a brain picture on it, 
no matter how unreliable it was or how far-fetched the claims, then I think you, there would be strong 403 arguments. But it's not clear because sometimes jurors seem to trust experts in brain imaging evidence and sometimes they seem to mistrust it. Um, I think the clearest evidence, I, I said jurors, I think I mean the general public. I think what we're starting to see emerge from the behavioral research on how brain images affect people is that like many other forms of scientific evidence or technology, um, people integrate that information into prior beliefs and engage in motivated reasoning, reaching a conclusion they might have been predisposed to reach anyway because it accords with a prior belief set. So I am not sure. I do worry that the ambiguity and especially the way this would actually play out in a courtroom is, you know, especially in a criminal case, but also in a lot of civil cases, the different sides are differently matched. And the side who can find the gray haired expert uh, who can stroke his beard and show fancy brain pictures that can like rotate a 3D brain is a form of zealous advocacy that appeals to jurors. I mean, I have been <laughs> consulted and then turned down for expert work. Your hair's not gray enough. Because I'm a young woman, because I don't have sufficient gravitas. And look, as a former litigator, I get it. Like, it's annoying, but I get it. On behalf of your client, you need to procure the expert who is most going to convince the jury. You're alluding to some of the more performative aspects of our of our judicial system. You know, we've talked to lawyers who, when trying a case in Texas or in Georgia, will will really lean into their their accent, even if in a regular day to day they don't. Jury trials are theater to some extent, right? We, especially high profile trials, is just as we've seen and are seeing right now as we record this. So. That is something that savvy trial lawyers know and take into account. Now, and there's, but there's going to be differently resourced sides and there's going to be judges who have different degrees of comfort with interrogating the experts and interrogating the technology. What impact this has on the jurors may depend on the jurors' comfort with scientific information. Some people are maybe more inclined to trust it. Some people may be inclined to distrust it. These are very idiosyncratic decisions. I don't think we have a clear picture of how it shakes out. I do think that right now, claims that are made by folks who are selling this software um, are overblown relative to what the software can do and therefore risk being unduly prejudicial because of overclaiming. Well, I mean, it's quite a dream. If you could just ask the defendant, did you do this or were you there? Did you kill this person or did you run this traffic light? And that's enough to get to the truth. Wow, that would really simplify criminal cases. That raises the question of whether we would get to a jury at all, right? I mean, 95% of criminal cases are resolved through plea agreements at this point. The, maybe it's irrelevant whether this information would get to, whether it would unduly influence a jury because it's going to, as we discussed a little bit in a different segment, it's going to coerce someone to tell the truth or to agree to a plea grip, plea deal because they think the technology the is, is more powerful than it right. is. Mm -hmm. Well, I suppose before we let you go, are there any parting words you'd like to leave us with when it comes to this technology or when it comes to the legal application of it? Extremely cautious optimism for the future. Not right now. This technique, I do not think that brain imaging techniques of trying to get at people's memories, certainly not to past mental states, um, is ready for primetime use. The technology is amazing for research applications. We are learning so much that's important about how memory actually works, but I don't think we should look to technology to solve problems that may be inherent limitations of just being human. Emily Murphy, thank you for taking the time to join us today. Joel, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much for the, the interest and the exciting conversation. I very much enjoyed it. And thank you for watching Talks on Law.